the budget cuts in the US and United States, uh, Mary, um, England. Um, Cameron recently began a series of massive cuts to the welfare state to negate the British budget deficit as many other countries have. He talks about tough times ahead and yet as he is someone born into absolute privilege and comfort, many people, me included, find such comments hypocritical. I mean, what does he know about tough times? And yet there's an argument which states it isn't important because I guess he understands the concept of financial hardship intellectually and therefore he maybe doesn't need to understand it empathetically. What's your position? Does a politician need to have endured a degree of poverty to make equitable, far-reaching decisions regarding it? No, not at all. I mean, take, say, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He came from wealth and privilege in big estates in New York, but uh, he was um, sympathetic to carrying out uh, highly progressive policies that uh, were of great benefit to the population. Uh, uh, Maybe it helps to know something about poverty, but it's certainly not uh, critical. You know, in fact, let's go back to the founder, you know, the hero of uh, the modern conservatives, who actually they hate his principles, but they put him up as a hero, Adam Smith. Yeah. I mean, his uh, moral philosophy, which was the foundation of his economic theory, was based on the assumption that uh, core human emotion is sympathy. Actually, David Hume, the other major founder of classical liberalism, same thing. Uh, and that is indeed a core human emotion. It takes real effort to drive that out of people's heads. In fact, it's kind of striking to see it. It takes a, the United States, I know better, uh, the early industrial revolution in the United States, it's right around here, eastern Massachusetts, the latter part of the 8th, 19th century. At that time, that was the period of the freest press in American history lots of newspapers, popularly run, lots of engagement, lots of readership. And many of the, uh, much of the press was coming out of the labor movement, you know, workers in factories and so on. What they called factory girls, young women from the farms, you know, moving into the textile factories, and Irish artisans from Boston and so on, they're running the papers. They bitterly condemned the new industrial system, which was destroying their culture, their lives, enslaving them and so on. But one of their main complaints was against what they called the new spirit of the age, gain wealth, forgetting all but self. And that's totally inconsistent with their just normal feelings. Now, it's taken 150 years to try to convince people that they should be committed to the new spirit of the age. And it's still going on massively. Now, that's why you have tax on uh, Social Security, on pensions, and so on. Now, those are all based on, the attacks are based on the new spirit of the age after 150 years. Uh, ordinary people don't feel that way. Now, they think we ought to have responsibility for a disabled widow across town who doesn't have enough money to eat. Uh, but uh, from the point of view of those who Adam Smith again called the masters of mankind, uh, they follow their vi what he called their vile maxim. All for ourselves, nothing for anyone else. That's the new spirit of the age. Uh, and from their point of view, why should I care about the disabled widow across town? And why should I care if the kid across the street has a school? I don't have kids in school, why should I pay taxes for that? You know, that's the new spirit of the age. And uh, I don't think that has much to do with whether you grew up in wealth or poverty. It has to do whether you are willing to allow your basic human uh, consciousness and understanding to prevail in your ordinary life, rich or poor. Yeah. Sort of on the same theme, but the banks are once again reverting to their previous position of huge bonuses and short-term greed, whilst the rest of us are beginning to feel the effects of the austerity measures, with large numbers of workers losing their jobs or having pain conditions severely affected. And yet I'm just shocked by how brazen the corporate world appears to be with Goldman Sachs, 15 billion in bonuses, just one example. They appear to have absolutely no concern over the growing hatred and anger that exists within the population towards them. Now I've heard you state that their raison d'etre is to create profit for their shareholders and companies in the short term. So problems that only may reach their zenith in a generation's time are irrelevant to the exigencies of now. However, this anger that I mentioned, if mobilised into action, could severely damage them in the short term and it's very hard to predict. Mm -hmm. Don't they care or are they counting on the general public remaining atomized and passive? Sure, that's what they're counting on. Uh, foreign policy works the same way. Actually, I was in England for a week, a couple months ago, 
every day the front page story about some scandal at Barclays Bank, you know, paying executives huge bonuses while people are suffering. That's the way the system's designed. Uh, and they are, yes, counting on the passivity of the public. Actually, there's a doctrine that uh, was expressed pretty clearly with regard to the Arab Spring. It was expressed by a man named Marwan Mouasher, who's the chief Middle East uh, analyst for the Carnegie Endowment, former Jordanian high official. Uh, I forget his exact words, but what he said is, uh, as long as the population is quiet, you can do anything you want. Uh, and that's correct domestically, too. Uh, Egypt is a very striking case. Uh, uh, this Arab, the, the sport from Mubarak is not coming out of nowhere. Uh, back in uh, the late 1950s, uh, President Eisenhower was concerned about what he called a campaign of hatred against us in the Arab world. And not among, not in the governments, they're okay, but among the people. And at the same year, the uh, uh, National uh, uh, Secur the Security Council, and it's the uh, main planning body, that came out with a study of this, and they explained it. They said there's a, there's the campaign of hatred is based on a perception in the Arab world that the United States supports harsh, brutal dictatorships, and we block development and democracy. Now we do this because we want to ensure control over their resources. And I went on to say that the perception is more or less accurate, and furthermore, that's what we should be doing. We'll count on the dictatorships to control the population, and uh, count on the Muasher doctrine, and that's fine. Uh, that's why uh, Obama supported Mubarak to the bitter end, count on the dictatorship to control the population. And it's going, it continues to go on, and it goes on domestically. As long as the population is Maybe they're angry, maybe they're frustrated, maybe they hate institutions. As long as they don't do anything about it, yeah. the masters of mankind will pursue their vile maxim. Um, moving on to Iraq, I was discussing my position recently regarding the Iraq war that, in my opinion, Blair and Bush should be at The Hague in front of the ICC, not that I ever expect this to happen. I was asked whether I wanted every leader of every country that was a member of the coalition of the willing to be placed on trial. What about countries that were a member of the coalition but didn't fight, like New Zealand, or countries that didn't have an army, such as Micronesia and Palau? What, were, what would your answer be? Well, it's basically the Nuremberg Principle. They didn't put everybody on trial. In fact, uh, lower-level people were not in, tried at Nuremberg. The people who were tried were the leaders, the decision-makers, the people who were sitting in the room while the decision was made to invade Poland. Uh, uh, people like von Ribbentrop, the foreign minister, who was hanged, incidentally. Uh, that's several charges. But the crime against peace was he was there when the decision was made to invade <laughs> Poland. Uh, he supported a preemptive war against Norway. The Nazis knew that the British were planning to invade from Norway, and they invaded first, preemptive war. Well, uh, you know, Powell, Colin Powell's more guilty than he was. Uh, but, but they didn't, you know, the, the, uh, the people who threw uh, bodies into the crematoria, they weren't charged at Nuremberg. Some were charged elsewhere, but the, and, and certainly not collaborators here and there. Right. And the same principle is true here. I mean, Blair and Bush and their close associates uh, made the decision uh, to invade another country to carry out the supreme international crime of Nuremberg, which, remember, as defined at Nuremberg and found its way into international law, that supreme international crime aggression. is a tribunal. It's aggression, but it's more than that. They said it's different from other war crimes because it encompasses all of the evil that follows. So in the case of Iraq, it encompasses uh, the destruction of the national heritage, the uh, sectarian warfare which tore the country to shreds is now spread over the region. Uh, these are huge consequences. Uh, millions of uh, uh, displaced people, and maybe even hundreds of thousands or more killed, you know, all of those are consequences. That's really serious. Uh, and uh, yeah, sure, they should be in a, you know, if law meant anything, they would be. Yeah. In fact, again, the Nuremberg principles are interesting. The uh, chief counsel for the prosecution, Justice Jackson, 
U.S. Justice, uh, he made a pretty impassioned appeal to the tribunal, saying uh, we're handing these defendants a poison chalice, and if we ever sip from it, uh, we have to be subject subjected to the same principles or else all trials are farce. It's not his exact words, but something like that. Uh, so we have a choice. Either the trial was a farce and we political, we murdered you know, the Nazi defendants uh, extrajudicially, or else you're right, it should apply to us.